are working on a what if tool to look at future scenarios, ways we can plan the future to work to a good pathway to Paris and so on that uh, can give us hope and that we look that is achievable but we can move forward in a positive way rather than um, just feeling, ah, uh, my gosh, you know, it's dreadful. I mean, it is terrible, but we can all do things incrementally. When the major glaciation stepped over and came down the Hawi here as well, and then came right down here to Bendigo. So we've got these big glacial terraces down there and a whole earlier system. It's just good to, to think about the nature of the country and the context for the planning. The wee block of land that we're dressing is that 42 hectares there and you can see it's right next to the Bendigo Wetland which is a wildlife reserve and it's a significant wetland at the head of Lake Dunstan. The land is right next to that so that's an interesting context. We've got the natural landform patterning, we've got the mighty Clutha, the Mata O, and we've also got the heritage of, of farming in that landscape that's been there for way more than a century. Those lovely alluvial flats have been irrigated for a long time. It used to be just wild flooding irrigated and then border diked and now with K-line spray irrigation. And so that's part of the heritage of the place. As landscape architects, we like to think that we need systems for these things to set the context for planning. And the only one we really have at the moment, and it's not even, I don't even think you can find them digitally, it's bizarre, is uh, ecological regions and districts. So that sets some sort of biophysical context for the place. So we're in the central Otago ecological region and the Dunstan ecological district. And that's useful because it affects tree growth and all these things if we're looking at um, so what you plant, but also how, how much carbon it's going to store and all the things. So you need to have a biophysical context. It, um, it's not good to, for New Zealand to just have a formula for how much you know, a carbon a pine takes up per year because they vary, you know, or whatever plant it is, it varies according to the local conditions. And so for me, um, sent, um, the ecological regions and districts are one accepted format, but then it's also useful later for implementing your plan to say what belongs there and what, where do you source your seed for any restoration planting. So I think it's a really important context to make sure is embedded. So anyway, people agree it's a, it's a biophysical context that is a nationally acceptable um, framework and then that sets that, you know, you know this is about the driest bit of New Zealand and, you know, that's what we're working with. And the character of that locale and those flats and um, seasonally uh, down in the lower river terrace getting the ephemeral wetlands um, on old channels, you see the waters coming through seasonally. So although it's a really dry bit of New Zealand, it's got a lot of wet areas seasonally. We worked that out when I went back to Lincoln because I was annoyed at superficial assessment stuff. And so to get an understanding of the land and a timeless understanding of the nature of land. So it didn't matter if it had pine trees or, you know, ryegrass on it or, or whatever. It was a, a character that would survive through, you know, right through. So from that stuff that we did and um, when Boffer School Lucas Associates did the Canterbury Regional Landscape Study and we uh, got 
the whole of Canterbury mapped as broad landscape types, land types, and then teased down to landform components in certain areas. That's been a good base, and that holds, you know, 1993, and it's as robust now as it was then. And, you know, it's been teased into since then, and we've done various regions around the country. I think that we need land typing because there's a problem with all the databases in New Zealand that they're all sort of sub-regional scale. They're not localised. So if we... When um, Leona and I went to the ETS and Agriculture workshop in Wellington, they're all saying Dairy and Z, Linz, everybody's saying the farm plan is the approach to go forward. Well, there's no data at a farm plan scale. Everything is generalised and we need data at a farm plan scale. When you take that broad land type map and then you take it down to the landform components and map them, then you know, it makes sense on the property. So there's the, that land type that applies in that landscape at Bendigo, the different components, which are always in those land type models, and then mapping that down at the site scale. So that's mapped there as a braided floodplain. And here's the meander floodplain and back swamps, you know, with all these ephemeral wetlands coming through, and here with the low terraces. And so it just makes it easy, doesn't it? And then you've got the, these um, scarps, the terrace scarps. It makes sense of the land with a typology. When I worked on that for my Lincoln thesis, on the approach, I said, New Zealand is so complex and so diverse and we don't necessarily need detail everywhere. So let's do a system that allows us to zoom in where we need it. So a nested hierarchy approach where we can zoom in at the site where you need it. So that's why it's like that, because we can't expect to have to map everything in a fine detail. However, to do farm plans, if it's not just pines or ryegrass and clover, the generic cover, we need to be able to get down to the detail, don't we, to understanding the land. To look at uh, mapping, at the modelling and at the typology there, You've got the types of vegetation on each of those landform components, the types of soil, you know, the elevations and all that. The detail is there. So it sets an approach that we can apply. And I just think that that is super useful for the farm plan. Johanna's mapped it so that she's shown those landform components below and then the waterways and so on and what's happening above and taken that through to show the current land use which is you know mostly irrigated pasture and then on the lowest level with the very high uh, water table especially seasonally high it's a non-irrigated pasture and then the blocks of plantings. She looked at the stocking um, of the, the land, the stock units and the seasonal patterns for the stocking with the sheep and the, and the cattle. And so then we can work out you know, the emissions from these. And then explored the different issues, um, pugging of land and exposed uh, ephemeral wetlands and so on, and she's well, identified those. A plan that just addresses the issues, that's all. And that's what typically farm plans would have done. But then she has looked at one 
that is a carbon neutral version of the grazed regime. You can see here there's a whole planting structure taken through and following these, these landform patterning and addressing the, the environmental issues. So she's got a planting framework right through and still leaves 60% is grazed and that comes out as a carbon neutral uh, arrangement. So I think for a lot of people that that would give them a lot of hope that that actually is carbon neutral. That still 60% of grazing and a lot of that's planted and they can be in you know, good production plantings and it can be phased in. I thought it was quite interesting to see what does carbon neutral look like and that's, you know, I think it's helpful just seeing that. Johanna's looked at uh, an alternative approach with entirely plant-based production. Different crops. Hemp uptakes carbon four times faster than trees. Yeah, but you've got to store the hemp somehow. You've got to, you know, not all legal yet, I suppose. But, <laughs> but that one, it comes out carbon um, positive, but not excessive, no, there's a lot of work to change to that. Then looking at those different land juices, the areas on each, working those out, and the carbon estimates for each land juice the total debt is 269 and the total debt with the conservative ones is 248 but here we are the carbon neutral one we just uh, and then the plant based one into a 15 ton credit i found it really interesting there's a huge difference in labour and infrastructure and everything for those but um, the option of, of carbon neutral through a planting and grazing regime I don't think is too onerous. We need to make some decisions really about the layout before we can actually cost it a bit I think because there's no simple one, one price thing, I don't think. Like if you bunged in the blocks of eucalypts, we could cost them. Um, yeah, so those tree blocks would be easier to cost. And then, you know, we know what the blocks of native planting would be. So what do you think, Joanna? We could separate it easily and, and cost it through. Hmm. Well, when I looked at the cost too. I thought about 269 tonnes of debit. If carbon's worth $25, that comes to about $7,000 a year. So that's, if you spent $7,000 a year on the plantings to transition it, I think it would be really cool if we could see if, how many years it would take to transition to the carbon neutral is to be responsible, not too excited about um, plant-based complex labour-intensive options. At the moment, yeah, it's quite simple with grazing. In that valley, the winds come up and down, you know, and so having good shelter across the valley could make quite a difference to um, grass production. So just losing the area doesn't necessarily mean losing the productivity. It's a what if tool. It's not trying to measure things precisely. It's saying what sort of scenario could we explore? Where might that put us? You know, how do we get to a hopeful future? <laughs>